Ethernet MAC addresses get all the attention when talking about Ethernet framing, but all the fields in an Ethernet frame impact how routers and switches work. I'll break it all down in this video. So here's where we're headed with this video. We'll start focusing on those MAC addresses. We'll talk through all the terminology and what the purpose and what the meaning of these addresses are. And then we'll talk about Ethernet frames and a little bit about processing those frames. Now, this topic comes at the end of the second chapter in volume one of my official CERT guides. And that section is a little bit long, so I broke it down into two halves. And this is part A, if you will, the first half of that discussion. So stick around to the end as usual, and I'll be thinking of things like we're in a study group together. I'll give you advice on where to focus your study after this video. In particular, I'll tell you about any resources here at this channel and also in the book. All right, let's jump in and talk about it. We'll start by reviewing encapsulation. So we've got a client app on the left and the server on the right. There's already some communication happening, and the client creates some more data to send. Now, with some application layer protocols, every message will also have an application layer header, and some won't, all right? But in this case, say there's an application protocol header that sits in front of that data. But then every time there's going to be a transport layer header, like, say, TCP if it's used, and then a network layer header, IP, and then a data link layer, both header and trailer, that encapsulates the whole thing, and that's what's transmitted per physical layer rules out the Ethernet adapter. Now that Ethernet header and trailer is where we're focusing our attention for the entirety of this video, so let's narrow it down and talk about, hey, well, what's just, you know, simple communication with a couple of PCs on an Ethernet, what's going on? Well, let's look at another example of here's the data and the application layer header and the transport and the IP header, and that can't travel across the LAN, so it gets encapsulated in this Ethernet frame. And two of the fields in that Ethernet header are the destination address followed by the source address. Indeed, the destination occurs first in the header. And you guessed it, the destination is who we want the frame to go to, and the source is who sends the frame. All right, so say if A wants to send something to B, then in this frame, the destination is going to be B's address and the source is going to be A's address. Now, the addresses aren't names. It's not text. So what do they look like? Well, they look like we see at the bottom left. It's 12 hex digits, represents a 48-bit number. That's why we use 12 hex digits when we write them or see them in show commands. You'll typically, uh, typically see them with four digits, dot, four digits, dot, four digits, or four digits separated by colons, but some separator every four digits or so. So there are three general types of MAC addresses. First is unicast, and it's the one you'd kind of think existed from the get-go. It's one address represents one network interface, one NIC on a PC or one switch port or one router interface, all right? In that previous example, A wants to send a message to B, an Ethernet frame to B, unicast addresses. Now, there's exactly one special address called the broadcast address. Its value is the all binary ones address, which in hexadecimal is all hex boxes. So 12 Fs there. And the purpose of that address is when used as a destination address, when you send a frame to the broadcast destination address, the switches in the network are supposed to flood that frame so everybody in the same LAN gets a copy of it. So it's a way for a protocol to send a message to everyone in the Ethernet. Then there's a third type of address. It's called a multicast address. And honestly, for CCNA, we don't really go there. But here's the general idea. One address can be used by a dynamic set of hosts who all want to receive copies of the same frame. So they can join, the host can join and leave the group so that when a frame is sent, only those hosts get a copy of the frame. But now let's talk about all these terms for unicast addresses. There are a lot of them. For instance, there's Ethernet address. It's pretty obvious that that'd be a good term for an address used in an Ethernet frame. But what about MAC address? Well, it turns out if you look at the standard for Ethernet, there's a media access control sublayer and a logical link control sublayer, and it's the MAC sublayer that defines the addresses, so MAC address. There's also kind of a generic term, LAN address, and a nod to, hey, Ethernet was originally a LAN-only technology, so it makes sense to call them LAN addresses. Or get this, how about burned-in address? When manufacturers make Ethernet cards, 
They assign a MAC address to the cards at the time of manufacture. Well, for the first couple of decades of Ethernet, the technology used to store that wasn't a disk drive and wasn't flash memory. It was this kind of memory for which the process to remember the address required repeated writing the address, and it burned it in to the device. Interesting, huh? Hence the name burned in address. And then there's NIC address in reference to the network interface card term. That's a reference to the Ethernet card itself. And then there's this term universal address, probably a little less popular, but it's a reference to the idea that these addresses should be unique universally, that is, in the universe or at least across the planet, right? So what do we mean by that? So the Ethernet universal address idea is this. If I've got a 12-hex digit address, the first tap uh, first half of these addresses assigned by the manufacturer are the manufacturer's code. It's called an OUI, Organizationally Unique Identifier. So if every manufacturer has one or more of these unique codes, and then the manufacturer, when it assigns the last few digits, never assigns the same uh, same value to multiple devices for their entire history, then the world together can ins- ensure universally unique addresses so that no MAC addresses are the same, all right? So a value assigned by the manufacturer in the second half, a value assigned by the IEEE in the first half to get these universal addresses. For instance, Cisco was given by the IEEE this nice handy five zeros in a C, OUI value early in its days, and then they could have created one MAC address like that, and the next one, and the next one, and so on, as long as they use unique values here, and as long as no other vendor used the five zeros and a Charlie value for the OUI, those MAC addresses would indeed be universal, that is, unique in the universe. And by the way, the videos are made to go well with the books. So if you haven't already checked out the books, please do. Here's a great link to use because if you don't have them and you do happen to choose to buy them, I'll make a few extra bucks given back to me by the booksellers. Doesn't cost you anything else. And it's a great way to support the channel. Thanks for that. All right, let's get back into it. So let's get into the details of this frame. First, there's going to be data, and that's what's given to Ethernet from the higher layer. So think IP version 4 packet or IP version 6 packet. But that data needs to be at least 46 bytes long per the Ethernet standard, so the standard calls for adding a padding of throwaway characters to get us up to 46 bytes if necessary. So think data plus pad here as needed. Then there's a two-byte type field that identifies what it is that's in here. For instance, there's a code for IP version 4 packet, another code for IP version 6 packet. Then in front of that, we've got the destination and source address, and those are the normal fields you would expect to see in an Ethernet header or trailer. The rest of the fields, sometimes people gloss over and don't pay as much attention to, which is fine, but the trailer has this thing called a frame check sequence. So here's the deal. The part that you see the brace around, the sender takes that, feeds it into a math equation, calculates it, and the result is a four-byte field, and that's the frame check. When the receiver receives the frame, they run the exact same math on the exact same part of the frame as shown here, and it should get the same math if there were no bit errors in transmission. If it gets a different answer to this math, then there were bit errors, and if there are bit errors, the receiver throws the frame away, end of logic. Ethernet doesn't attempt any error recovery at that point, all right? So frame check sequence to check to see if it had any errors. Then finally, there's a combined preamble and start a frame delimiter. It's a combined eight bytes. And the preamble is alternating ones and zeros. Start frame delimiter has one bit different than that. And the idea is to signal so that the physical layer can see a bunch of changes in the bit pattern so it knows, hey, here comes the destination address part of the frame. All right, so that was a lot to just say out loud. So you can hit pause if you like to and look at this table for reference to get a reminder of some of those details. So let's talk through an example of A sending to B, and we'll start with how to encapsulate on the host A side. So there's an IPv4 packet, and IPv4 wants an Ethernet frame to send the packet to B. So IPv4 hands this off to the Ethernet code, and the Ethernet code says, hey, let me build an Ethernet type for IPv4, and it turns out the Ethernet type value for that is hex 0800. Uh, You'll see that a lot when you're looking at traces of what's going on in the network. 
but just continuing on the process, A's MAC address, the sender's or source MAC goes before that. B, the destination MAC goes before that. The preamble and start frame delimiter goes before that, right? We just talked about those fields. The frame check goes at the end of the frame, and it was calculated based on the part you see inside the brackets, starting with the destination MAC address all the way through the end of the data. All right. And by the way, I didn't mention the terms before, but that type field in here, whose value is 0800 in this case, we call it the type field, but the technical term inside the standard is ether type. You'll also hear it called ethernet type or protocol type. All right. So then on the B side, when B receives the ethernet frame, it's got to do some work as well. Now, generally we'll wave our hands at this and say B processes and throws away the ethernet header and trailer, but here's the specifics. All right. So it's got to find the frame, and one of the reasons this preamble and start frame delimiter exists is so that the physical layer can see enough transitions in the electrical signal to say, hey, I, I know exactly where the frame is, where the beginning part is. So it finds that beginning of the frame, and then it doesn't need the preamble and start frame anymore. Then it checks for errors here at step two, which it uses the frame check sequence for that. And let's say it passes that frame check sequence check. So that process is done. It doesn't need the frame check sequence anymore. Then it looks at the destination MAC address. In this case, it lists B's MAC address, whatever that is. Remember, this is B doing the processing. And B's logic is going to be something like, hey, this is sent to me. Obviously, I should process it. Mine, 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 mine. Let me process. Then it looks at the type field, and it says, hey, I'm checking the type. It's identifying IP version 4 as the type, and that's important. Why? Because now that host B knows that what's in here is an IPv4 packet, it knows what next software to give this data to, be it IPv4 code or IPv6 code, for instance. Then at step five, give the packet to the IPv4 process there on host B. So if I was helping you with a CCNA study group, here's what I'd tell you right about now. First off, Understanding those frame fields and what they're there for, that's very important. So understanding is, but you're going to memorize these fields by accident just by continuing down your journey. So memorize those things over time. You don't have to stop what you're doing and just devote time to memorizing. You're just going to come across them a lot throughout your CCNA journey. So don't worry about the memorization so much. All right, as for an exercise here at the channel, I've got a video that it's what I call an interview review that'll guide you through an interview process. You should do the interview for yourself somehow, but you can also watch my discussion of it. So you just learned about it, give it some space, maybe a day or two, and then do the interview. And the interview review is about Ethernet encapsulation and framing and what those fields are, where you get asked about it. And I'll tell you what I'd be listening for if you were to do that interview. Then with the books, it's always good to go look at the matching section in the books. Most people use at least two resources to get a second voice and a second approach, which I always try to give you comparing the books and the videos. Hey, thanks for sticking around to the end. If you're ready for that next video, if you click on the left, you move on to the next instructional topic where we'll talk about half duplex, CSMA CD, and full duplex. Or on the right, you can get to that interview review video and do that interview work to get better at framing. Hope you enjoyed the video. I'll talk to you soon.